Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker, and you're watching Newswipe, a programme all about what the bloody hell's been going on, such as this. Unemployment now so huge it has to be depicted by plummeting monolithic numbers. World's most evil man can't even be bothered to stop reading his blue book during trial of the century. And Pope doesn't understand how condoms work, shocker. <laughs> that crazy Pope. <laughs> but first... Viewed from a distance, our world, planet Earth, looks like a serene, slowly revolving orb, or a novelty beach ball. But it's not. It's actually a complex and bewildering hive of activity filled with people and objects and resources and institutions and belief systems and sugar babes and field mice and godless buses and lord knows what. It's chaos, essentially, and we're all stuck right down here in the middle of it. And who amongst us truly understands what's really going on? To have some idea of how things work, you're supposed to have been watching the news every day of your bloody life. Although the chances are you haven't, at least not really. I mean, when were you meant to start? When you're a kid, the news is effectively out of bounds. It's a programme aimed at adults that's either impenetrably boring... The economy minister for the economy today said interest rates were discombobulating the trade union... ...or outright terrifying. Murdered horses and terrorists today said that you and your mummy and daddy are certain to die in a global... End result is you ignore the news for years and then suddenly when you're a bit older there comes a point when you realise you've become completely bloody ignorant. Maybe you find yourself sitting next to some erudite f at a dinner party who's banging on about the Israel-Palestine situation. Or maybe you start going out with an opinionated news junkie who wants to discuss politics for 16,000 hours. Either way, the depth of your ignorance leaves you ashamed, so you do something about it. You pick up a paper or switch on the news. But because you've fallen behind, it's like tuning into episode 803 of the world's most complex soap opera. And at the same time, the news itself is becoming less of an easily digestible summary of events and more of a grotesque entertainment reality show with heavy emphasis on emotion and sensation and a swaggering, comically theatrical sense of its own importance. The world has changed, and we must change with it. Politicians and newsmakers know this, which is why everything's geared more and more towards sound bites and razzle-dazzle. The soap opera analogy is a fitting one because that's what the news has become. It's showbiz, basically, and as a consequence, the news has become just another rolling TV show whose meaning is lost somewhere among all the babble. Sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's sad, but somehow it isn't real. Well, this show's going to put an end to all of that forever, or at least 29 minutes. The aim is to provide a fun, snarky weekly digest that will help keep you, and hopefully me, on top of the new soap opera. And it starts now. Oh, it seems like only yesterday we were all loaded, but now not a day goes by without us being bombarded by bad news about the economy, with the recent grim unemployment figures being the icing on the cake. How did it come to this? Well, the trouble began in America when US banks granted mortgages to subprime customers. These high-risk loans were bundled together with other less risky loans into collateralised debt obligations, or CDOs, kind of like boxes of assorted chocolates. These were flogged to investors around the world until interest rates in the US rose, causing many of those subprime customers to default on their mortgages, effectively turning those risky chocolates into little balls of shit. By the time things went bad, so many of these suspect toxic asset boxes had been sold, none of the banks knew how many shitty boxes the other banks were holding, and they all became reluctant to lend to each other as a result. That seizing up was the credit crunch that caused the current problem! OK, did you follow that? No. Of course you didn't, because you're a rational human being. The world of global economics makes less sense than me going... But nevertheless, when it goes wrong, the news can make it seem terrifying. Today, stock markets across the world tumbled, imploded, continued to collapse like deflated dirigibles. After all, if the boom of the past decade was all a dream, then the current situation is a nightmare rendered in calculus. Meaninglessly huge numbers, sliding graphs, a CGI Red Arrows display team crashing repeatedly to the floor, and one frightening prognosis after another. It's so bad, leaders of the G20 are having to get together in the world's most disappointing razzle pile-up in a desperate bid to save the world from global cash apocalypse. Yes, everything about the economy is scary these days. Even the Financial Services Authority have made Channel 4 News scary with stark warnings like this. There is a view that people are not frightened of the FSA. People should be very frightened of the FSA. Mm, he's not wrong. People already are frightened of the FSA. <laughs> Of course, the news hasn't been too scared of using the financial mess to pad out their bulletins. On a slow news day, you can tie almost any story into it. It's the gift that keeps on giving. 
You can shit out some chirpy guff about feeding your pets on a budget. Don't worry about wasting money on treats, because dogs are actually much better off with something simple like a nice raw carrot. There you go, boys. Or a fashion item on how the recession's going to influence your choice of dress at the Oscars. You look amazing. Or consumer advice telling viewers where to head for a romantic bargain. You can buy two wedding rings for just £18. They're made of tin. Or a human interest report on a jobless hunk reduced to selling himself on the streets. He's advertising his services during morning rush hour in Manchester. Trying to find myself a job. I'm not waiting for it to come to me. This is my way of doing it. Or you could follow the lead of upbeat CBS Evening News and cheerfully explain that maybe the world's lunatics can save us. 8% of people think that the economy is getting better. Who are these people? And can their delusions actually save our economy? Or you can highlight the villains like Louis Walsh lookalike Frederick the Shredderick, who makes everyone so angry even Linda Bellingham called for a peasant's revolt on lightweight daytime festival of chit-chat loose women. Look at the French Revolution. Why are we sitting about all the time letting people like Gordon Brown walk roughshod over? Let's have a revolution. Every day there's been baffling new terminology to learn, with the latest being quantitative easing, the Bank of England's recent attempt to stop the economy tumbling into a great big bin full of bums. Now, unless you speak fluent jargon, it's not immediately clear what quantitative easing actually is. In fact, as Newsnight found out when they hit the streets to ask human beings, even Brainiac Moss from the IT crowd doesn't know what it is. Uh, uh, the easing of quantitativeness... Thank God, then, that the news is on hand to describe exactly what quantitative easing is in easy-to-follow metaphorical steps. Put simply, quantitative easing is a tool for fixing a blockage in an economy that isn't running smoothly. There you go, it's a sort of spanner, made of money. But how does it work? Well, I suppose you twist it into the stock market. It's like creating money out of thin air or filling up a petrol tank with imaginary petrol. That... What most economists agree is needed to get any recovery started. Oh, God, he isn't making any sense. What I need is someone who can't help but speak in profoundly simple terms. Hello, welcome to Five News. I'm Natasha Kaplinsky. He, <laughs> who, I'm preemptively chuckling because I reckon she's about to tell us it's designed to encourage the banks and us to get lending and spending. It is designed to encourage the banks and us to get lending and spending. Our chief correspondent, Jonathan Samuels, investigates whether these measures will help an economy that's been going off the rails. Why, Natasha, that almost sounds like a cue for a bad railway metaphor. The economy at the moment seems to be like a runaway train. Great, all right, let's see you run with this one. The government's been pulling lots of levers behind the scenes to try and slow down the economic crisis, but it's got to such a stage now that they're trying a different track. Just tell me how it works. It's called quantitative easing. The idea is to pump more money into the economy and get banks lending again. Toot toot, the economy's made of trains. We once had a model economy. The government hopes the latest measures will mean we soon see light at the end of the tunnel. The thing is, baffling though all these visual metaphors are, they're not a patch on quantitative easing itself, which essentially consists of one branch of government using dreamed-up money to buy chunks of debt from another branch of itself. But will it work? Well, here's what Mervyn King, Governor of the Bank of England, had to say on Dynamic 5 News. Nothing in life is ever certain. Changing interest rates is not certain. These measures, we think, will work in the long run. I can't be sure how long it will take. Much of this will depend on what's happening in the rest of the world. In other words, oh, I don't know. And that's the problem with the economy in a nutshell. It's a big bunch of unknowns. Nobody knew we were going to get into this mess. Nobody knows how bad it will get. Nobody knows how we'll get out of it. Nobody knows anything. Now, the global financial crisis might be frightening, but is it also a golden money-making opportunity? Danielle Ward finds out. The credit crunch is over. We're in recession. It's official. And we're reminded of it everywhere. The news media got so much mileage from the credit crunch, it even found its way into the Oxford English Concise Dictionary. So you hear credit crunch and you think, how exciting, shopping on a budget. I'll be ironic and serve beans on toast and Lambrini at my dinner party. There's some solidarity between us. We were cozying up together. We were battening down those hatches. But when I hear recession, I think of joblessness, homelessness, hopelessness. Everyone's out for themselves and it's just not fun anymore. 
Uh, Louise, it's a mess. What do you think when you think of recession? What does it conjure up in your mind, the word? It's depressing. And everywhere you go, you're having it. Recession. We should get rid of the depressive words and try and think of positive ways to get out of this situation. So everybody's fed up with the recession. It's in the papers, it's on the news. No one wants to hear this word anymore. It's time we rebranded it and sexed it up. Norwich Union successfully rebranded itself a Viva with a celeb heavy big budget campaign. And then it Ringo Starr rebranded himself a Bell End. Would any of this have happened to me if I'd have still been Richard Starkey? I rounded up some genuine creative TV people to see what we could come up with. How do we sex up the recession? What we need is like a craze. Do you remember those bands came out and it was all like, oh, this means I'm against, like, racism. You could have one that just means I recognise we're in a credit crunch one and we could sell them for, like, 250. Yeah, that's a good idea. What colour would they be? Um, so grey. We'll get some guys working on it. For, for 50 grand, they'll just work that out for us. Are we going to have a phrase? I think, I think it's a word. I think it's a big word. Yeah. It's a word that's kind of, you know... Apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic. Something apocalyptic. Pocket apocalypse. Um, Pocket ellipse. After what felt like literally hours of blue sky thinking, we came up with a new and very exciting 21st century concept. Goodbye recession. Hello money Geddon. If we can rebrand the recession as something vibrant and appealing, perhaps we can even make money out of it. I mean, if they can flog ground zero baseball caps, I don't see why we can't sell some recession merch. So I set up a stall selling money getting t shirts, mugs, key rings, and survival bottles of water to see if I could profit from my recession rebrand. If you loved Credit Crunch, you will adore Money Geddon. We've rebranded the recession because we thought it was a rubbish word. It made everybody depressed, whereas Money Geddon makes everybody angry, united and thrilled at the same time. It's not like when Cocoa Pops became Choco Krispies and they had to go back. This is it now. Money Geddon is the recession. You enjoy that. It tastes of tears. Oh, right, well, uh, that, I'm afraid that's what we're all shedding with this recession. Right, I'll have that. I made a substantial £9.46 and pence. And while that may not be quite enough to keep me in Fred the Shred style luxury, I think I could be onto something. So what have we discovered today other than I would be rubbish on The Apprentice and I look like a young Tory in this t-shirt? Well, we rebranded the recession, we made it money again, and, and you know what? It sells. Not very well, but it sells. That is absolutely unputdownable. Anyway, the news wasn't all recession this week. No, there was room for plenty of bullshit too. Religion, and while en route to Africa, big chief Catholic man Pope Benedict Luftwaffe the 16th enlivens Channel 4 News by sharing his scientific wisdom. It's a tragedy, this question of AIDS. That cannot be overcome by money alone, and that cannot be overcome through the distribution of condoms, which even aggravates the problems. Oh yeah, these condoms I've been using have really aggravated my AIDS. The Pope's startling claim provoked a fiery debate back at the studio featuring a religious woman so irrational Jon Snow didn't even try to hide his amusement. Clearly a condom is the only intelligent thing to do. No, and it's no use saying that you think a bit of rubber will protect you. Yeah, you should just put your faith in an unprovable man in the sky. Listen to the facts. When the um, AIDS epidemic in Uganda started going up, it was when they introduced condoms. Before that, it had gone down using only the Catholic method. Yeah, in case you're wondering, the Catholic method is to remove the condom and then bury the head of your penis in the sand. 22 million people have got AIDS now because of the condom campaign is making it worse, not better. Me. Now, how much does the PR industry affect the current affairs agenda? Here's Nick Davis, author of Flat Earth News, with his take. Journalists, on the whole, are chained to keyboards in offices and they recycle second-hand information from Newswire and from the public relations industry. And neither of these sources of information is reliable, but both of those sources are recycled, largely unchecked, into what we laughingly call news. And so as journalists get weaker and weaker in performing their job, the PR industry moves in and fills the gap. There's a brilliant example of this with the NatWest 3, who are these three businessmen who worked for a subsidiary of the National Westminster Bank, who got caught up in the aftermath of the collapse of Enron. Within months, evidence is surfacing that the NatWest 3 are embroiled in corrupt and illegal activities. By 2002, the FBI have charged them with criminal offences, and the press have clearly established that these three are bad guys. But there is a single fact in there, which is that they're going to be extradited to the United States with a new piece of law, which is not very fair. So on that slender basis, 
The PR company who were hired by the NatWest 3 just focused the story on the unjust law. And at that moment, suddenly, the whole angle changes. So almost everybody across the entire political spectrum in the House of Commons and the House of Lords was drawn in by this PR campaign to support it. I have no idea of whether these men are guilty or innocent. But one thing does seem to me to be clear, that on the question of jurisdiction, uh, any crime that they may have committed it seems to me to have been committed in this country and not in the United States. One of the things that the PR people did was to play the family card. They set up interviews, sometimes the man with the wife, sometimes the wife on her own, and it's to do with making them human victims. We see, feel sorry for the wives and the children who be left behind. It's suggested that they may lose their homes. So they were heavily played. He doesn't know when he may come back here, and what faces him in Texas is in stark contrast to this. These guys were stealing millions of bucks. I mean, they were very, very greedy crooks. But that fact got rather lost in the coverage. They will be given green boiler suits, prisoners' uniforms, which they will have to wear tonight at a detention centre nearby. Now, although Rory was saying it's quite a, a modern building, it's also been described to me just in the last hour as pretty grim. According to the PR stories that were being put out, when these guys got to the States, they were going to be held on bail for years. In fact, they were held in a hotel for rather a short period of time. They were going to be appearing in court with orange jumpsuits and loads of chains. In fact, they appeared in their own clothing, and then they faced jail sentences of 35 years. In fact, they got 36 months. So the whole image of this cruel, ruthless American judicial system that was going to be so ghastly, that was going to treat them like kind of Guantanamo Bay detainees, was really not strictly true. Finance and transport, and Sky News' Dermot Murnahan traverses the southwest of England on a bike, seeking out tales of financial woe in a series of reports called, amazingly, The Economic Cycle. Apart from getting a sore ass, he found plenty of sorrowful and jobless real people to talk to in what was surely designed to be the most heart-tugging reportage of the year. The trouble is he didn't always seem to find quite as much financial misery as he wanted. What happens, you know, if the sun doesn't shine, if it pours with rain, or the tourists just don't come because they haven't got the money? How much longer can you last? Well, I think we can last. I think people are realising that um, right. they're not going abroad, and I think they're realising yeah. that our country, yeah. and certainly Cornwall, right. is yep. just such a stunning yep. place. Yep. And most right. Next. The... Just talking to Ian out there, I mean, it's fingers crossed, isn't it, for, for this season? You don't know how it's going to pan out, do you, see? It's looking good, though. Why do you say that, Kirsten? Um Bookings are up 50% mm. this time last year, um, and we're having a lot more inquiries. Oh, God. How are you being treated by your banks? Are they saying, look, Tony, Julie, we understand times are hard, do you need a bit of extra cash here, or are they saying something different? I think it's not been too bad. I've not had a problem right. properly, and I must admit yeah. that I've been on something very, very yeah. helpful. Brilliant, and, uh, great, at the moment, great, not had any brilliant. Problems. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> How are things holding up in this economic downturn for you? And it's not, not too bad, actually. It's quite, it's, it's right. looking good yeah. for the current right. season. Oh, this is bullshit. Very... Why are you optimistic? Look, I don't want to underplay recession, but, but guys like you and uh, the newspapers do love a lousy story about how oh, we're going to yeah. hang the handcart. Yeah, uh, and thanks. And in many ways, what's Fascinating. Uh, yeah. I yeah. think is a really good yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, whatever. Was... Poetry now with our topical verse correspondent, Tim Key. Uh, this poem is about um, bankers, the dreadful um, bastards, the dreadful bastards who work in banks, screwed the country over. Anyway, I'll let the poem, let the poem do the talking. This horrible fucking banker figure sat his fat ass down on a chair in Amanda's office. And in brackets, I've got Amanda's part of HR, human resources. The banker had caviar and swan round his chops. <laughs> and his hair was stuck down to his forehead with sweat. Just a despicable... He was panting. Exhausted from the short walk from the glass elevator to the office. Imagine this big fat... And by 14 years of greed, Amanda leaned forward and he peered lustily down her top. Same as like when he leered at the dancers in the strip joints in which he blew his money throughout the 90s. 
He licked his lips, clonking fish eggs and feathers onto the floor. We're going to have to let you go. Amanda smiled. Is it because the bottom's fallen out? Yes. Is it linked in with me and me mates being irredeemably greedy twerps in the good times? Yes. That and also complaints about your hygiene. Our lumpen banker staggered away in waves of tears. He staggered to his lawyer. And his lawyer sorted everything out and he got an excellent redundancy package in the end. Horrible man. You know, when I suggested doing this screen wipe current affairs spin-off type show, I thought it would be a good exercise in self-improvement. But in fact, all it's done is depress me because the news is so horrible. Uh, we believe from what the police officer was telling us that he killed his 74-year-old grandmother, also his mother, his uncle, his cousin, his 15-year-old second cousin. In addition, he killed a baby, he killed a sheriff deputy's wife, he killed two pedestrians, he killed a petrol station assistant, he killed a motorist, he let loose seven rounds at a trooper, he shot the chief of police and he shot himself. I will let you digest that for a moment. Which isn't to say the world itself is horrible. I mean, it's still full of sunshine and flowers and cuddly creatures you'd like to have sex with, like this rabbit. Oh, look at that rabbit. Anyway, I guess what I'm saying is there's generally more good than bad in the world, unless you're watching the news, which likes to accentuate the negative at every turn. For instance, a few weeks ago at a homecoming parade for our boys, a small group of 15 to 20 Islamist protesters kicked up a stink by wobbling a load of antagonistic placards around and loudly decrying Western imperialism from behind a line of Western imperialists defending their right to shout about the system that was permitting them to shout. If you see what I mean. Predictably, the protest outraged some well-wishers so much things quickly turned ugly. Yes, before long, two people were arrested, one for climbing on top of a supermarket and throwing a packet of bacon at the protesters. So a tiny minority of another minority try to stir up some outrage and there's two arrests. Not a huge deal. Except the news thought differently, of course. To the news, it was a huge deal. It provided dramatic material for news bulletins, fantastic emotive copy for populist tabloid headlines, and a great starting point for countless hours of confused debate on shows like Banal Morning, Guff Storm, The Right Stuff. Steve, what's your feelings on this? Right, well, I, I totally um, think it's bad that they um, tried to uh, protest and uh, basically... basically um... And shorter bursts of simplistic yes-no debate on decisive Sky News. Hello? Hello. Yes, uh, uh, I think probably... Hello? Meanwhile, radical cleric Anjum Chowdhury, who heads the group that arranged the protest, was all over cosy GMTV, enjoying the publicity and their comfy sofa. Yes. And the reality is, you see, that if we had this demonstration at another time, when the parade was not taking place, it probably wouldn't have got the coverage that it's got, and I wouldn't be here now talking about it Anjum, on your programme. you've okay. certainly got us all going this morning. There's been a lot of dialogue, and dialogue has to be considered a good thing, I guess. Thank you it's very much. It's good that you can come and talk to us about it. Yes, thanks, Anjum. Now, would you like an infidel biscuit? Mmm, they're lovely. There was also another parade scheduled to take place that day, which the news excitedly cut to. But wouldn't you know it, when the moment of truth came, the Watford march passed off without incident and the news was left without the story. Parades, let's have a listen to see what's, uh, what's going on down there in Watford. No, no, nobody's showing baby killers, this is boring, fuck it. Still, while there wasn't even the tiniest protest in Watford, there was a huge protest taking place in Northern Ireland, where thousands of demonstrators were taking to the streets in the name of peace. Yes, that's thousands of protesters coming together to demonstrate against the recent upsurge in Republican violence. So surely if 15 to 20 protesters in Luton gets a lot of coverage, surely thousands of protesters in Northern Ireland is going to get even more, right? Wrong. Tonight at 10, a mass shooting at a school in Germany leaves 16 people dead. Yes, because on the same day as the peace demonstration, a lone maniac in Germany went berserk with a gun, killing 16 people. This senseless tragedy provided material for news reports for days to follow. First, there were the initial dramatic breakdowns detailing precisely how the carnage unfolded. There was grim, voyeuristic mobile phone footage of the gunman's last moments and a chilling reconstruction of a warning he apparently posted on the internet. He typed these words, everybody's laughing at me, 
No one sees my potential. I'm serious. Which later turned out to be almost certainly false, incidentally. The aftermath in Vinodon proved so compelling for the vulture-like rolling news stations, they even filled airtime showing things that weren't happening yet. Two days later, even footage from an old ping-pong tournament in which the back of the gunman's head was vaguely visible was still considered news. The latest pictures of Kretschmer show him playing table tennis, his favourite sport. And three days later, even worse footage pixelated to the point where it looked like a broadcast from the f***ing Lego dimension. Well, that was considered news too. In the video, Kretschmer is shown taking part in an arm wrestling contest in Rottenburg last year. Yeah, I think if I squint, I can just about make out the face of a killer. Isn't the news brilliant? Repeatedly showing us a killer's face isn't news, it's just rubbernecking. And what's more, this sort of coverage only serves to turn this murdering little twat into a sort of nihilistic pin-up boy. One thing the news kept plaintively asking was why this had happened. Why? What had triggered in the mind of a seemingly normal teenager such fury and alienation? Well, if you want to know why, why not ask a forensic psychiatrist? We've had 20 years of mass murders, throughout which I have repeatedly told CNN and our other media, if you don't want to pr propagate more mass murders, don't start the story with sirens blaring. The school day had only just begun when the attacker struck. Don't have photographs of the killer. The 17-year-old's three-hour rampage ended in his own death. Don't make this 24-7 coverage. The German Chancellor is about to give her reaction. We'll bring that to you live. Do everything you can not to make uh, the body count the lead story. Carnage in the classroom. 16 people are dead. Not to make the killer some kind of anti-hero. Dressed in black combat gear, the gunman opened fire at random. Do localize this story to the affected community and make it as boring as possible in every other market. Because every time we have intense saturation coverage of a mass murder, we expect to see one or two more within a week. But, but we have, but I mean, ho ho hold on a second here. In summary then, not only does bad news always trump good news, but that bad news might itself actually help create more bad news. Which is good news, if you're the news. <sighs> Well, that's all we've got time for this evening. Go away. And Charlie's back with another news wipe next Wednesday at half past ten. Next tonight, all aboard the hospital train in India.